section 6.5, average value of a function. Remember that to take an average, we add up all the numbers we want to take the average of and divide by how many numbers it is. So if we had a whole bunch of y values, like y1 plus y2 plus, you know, a whole bunch of y values all the way up to like, let's say, n y values, y n, we would divide by n, and that would give us the average of all of those y values. However, functions in general have an infinite number of y values. So we can't just add up an infinite number of numbers and divide by that many. Instead, we have to get a little bit more creative. What we could do is we could look at a function that has an infinite number of y values all along the function. And instead of trying to add up all of those, we just look at, let's say, an interval. And we say that one of those y values in the interval can represent the entire interval. And we say that the uh, value of the, or the average along that interval will be that y value divided by however long that interval is. So that'll give us like an approximation for the average value of the function by cutting it up into all of those little intervals, assuming that I actually draw this nicely and make all of these nice rectangles. So that should look familiar. That's a uh, Riemann sum. So instead of dividing by n, remember that this uh, little width delta x is equal to b minus a over n. So I could just divide by b minus a over delta x. So I could have a whole bunch of y values. Let's say f of x1, but choosing them at some point inside of the interval would mean choosing, let's say, a sample point. So I should really call it x1 star. And I'll add that to another y value, f of x2 star, and so on, all the way up to, mm, that didn't come out very good, all the way up to f of xn star. And then instead of dividing by n, I divide by b minus a over delta x, because that's what n is. So in that case, remember dividing by a fraction flips it and multiplies, so the delta x jumps out in front. The b minus a stays 1 over b minus a, so I could write that 1 over b minus a if I wanted to. And I end up with uh, a sum. If I take the limit as that goes to infinity, I end up with an integral. So notice the delta x jumps out and becomes the dx. All of these little f values that we add up are the f of x, and the b minus a we divide by is 1 over b minus a. So when we take the limit as n goes to infinity, our approximation for the average actually becomes exactly equal to the average. So this will give us the average value of the function. So it makes sense why this would be our definition for the average value of a function. You can also see this geometrically as um, the area underneath the curve, that's the integral part, divided by b minus a, which is how long the curve is. If there's a and here's b, then b minus a is the length. So you could think of this geometrically as area divided by width equaling height. But height is not uniform, so area divided by width gives you the average height. Let's do an example of this. How about we find the average value of the function f of x equals 1 plus x squared on the interval from minus 1 to 2. So in this case, a is equal to minus 1 b is equal to 2. So our average value of our function is 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx, which is 1 over 2 minus minus 1 times the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 plus x squared dx. Taking antiderivatives, we get 1 third times x plus x cubed over 3, evaluated from minus 1 to 2, which is 2. This leads us to the mean value theorem for integrals. If f is continuous on the closed interval a, b, 
then there exists a number c in AB such that f of c is equal to the average value of the function. So in other words, if we take b minus a and multiply both sides, then we end up with the integral equaling f of c times b minus a. So let's prove this real quick. We can apply the mean value theorem for derivatives to the function capital F of x equal to the integral. So if we do that, we get that the derivative is equal to the average rate of change. So remember the mean value theorem says that there is a number somewhere such that the average rate of change equals the instantaneous rate of change. In other words, where the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the secant line. So then we take the derivative of this uh, integral over here, because that's what f prime of c is equal to. But remember, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of the integral is equal to the function itself evaluated at x. Because we're evaluating at c, this is just equal to f of c. And then I split off the b minus a. I just multiply by 1 over b minus a. So that's the uh, exact same thing as the integral, because uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus part 2. So we use the mean value theorem, fundamental theorem of calculus part 1, and fundamental theorem of calculus part 2 to prove the mean value theorem for integrals. Notice why we call this the mean value theorem for integrals. Well, for derivatives, we said that there was some c value somewhere where the slope of the secant line would equal the slope of the tangent line. The instantaneous rate of change would equal the average rate of change. Here we say that there is a point somewhere where the average value of the function will actually equal the value of the function. So let's do an example. How about we find a number c in the interval minus 1, 2 that satisfies the mean value theorem for integrals for the function 1 plus x squared. Notice that f of x equals 1 plus x squared is a polynomial. So that means it is continuous. We always have to check that our function satisfies whatever hypothesis our theorem requires. So the mean value theorem for integrals implies that there exists some c value inside of the interval from minus 1 to 2 such that the integral from minus 1 to 2 of 1 plus x squared dx is actually equal to f of c times the length of the interval 2 minus, uh, I should probably write that in parentheses, minus 1. Uh, we just did an example 1, right? This function. And we calculated its average. So we already know that the average value is 2. So example 1 tells us that the f of c equal to the average value is 2. So 1 plus x squared evaluated at c, which is 1 plus c squared, that's got to equal 2 somewhere. So that means c squared is equal to 1 somewhere. So c is equal to plus or minus 1. So this is kind of cool. They told us to find a number c in this interval that satisfies the mean value theorem for integrals, but we actually found two values, plus 1 and minus 1. So we could graph this thing to see what it looks like. So if here's minus 1, here's 0, here's 1, and say here's 2, because we're going from minus 1 to 2. Our function looks something like this, a nice parabola, supposed to be symmetric, but I cannot draw it very well. So we keep going. So here we are from 
minus 1 to 2. This is the point minus 1, 2. This is the point. Uh, plugging in 1, 1, 2. And this is the point 2, 5. So this is the graph of y equals 1 plus x squared. If I take a look at the average value, remember the average value is 2. So that's if I were to draw the line y equals 2. This is the average value. Notice that it hits it twice. It hits it over here at minus 1, and it hits it again over here at 1. Let's show that the average velocity of a car over a time interval t1, t2 is the same as the average velocity, the average of its velocities. So we're going to show the average velocity is equal to the average of all of the velocities. If it wasn't, then this would be pretty bad. So we should definitely be able to show this. Remember that the average velocity. is equal to the change in um, displacement over time. So how about we say s of t is displacement. That means that this is delta s over delta t. So change of displacement over change in time. But that's the same thing as like y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Since we're doing everything in terms of t, this is the same as s of t2 minus s of t1 divided by t2 minus t1. So this is the average velocity. Let's now compute the um, average of all of the velocity values. So that's v av, like for the f average. By our definition, this is 1 over t2 minus t1 times the integral from t1 to t2 of v of t dt. And hopefully this is equal to the average velocity. Well, this is the same thing as saying 1 over t2 minus t1 times the integral from t1 to t2 of the derivative of position, because velocity is derivative of position. So replace v of t with s prime. Now we can use the net change theorem that says that this will be 1 over t2 minus t1 times s of t2 minus s of t1. Remember the net change theorem is basically the fundamental theorem of calculus part 2 for uh, rates of change. Well, that's exactly what we wanted to show, right? That's s of t2 minus s of t1 over t2 minus t1, which is the average velocity.